It is different up here. Well, good morning, fellas. We're going to look at Galatians chapter 1 today. We're going to focus in on verses 6 through 10. Um, when I set out to prepare a message for class, it was kind of interesting. I, I just started reading the Pauline epistle because that seemed like a good, good way to get a text. And I stopped at Galatians, and I thought, well, I'll just start reading here, see if I can get anything to talk about. And I actually made it to the second paragraph, and, <laughs> and the Lord started feeding me, so I figured, well, I guess I'll stop here. But we know the book of Galatians as being a book that is in its entirety about no other gospel. It's about Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. And the people of Galatia were being manipulated to turn from that gospel a bit. But really what you see and what I, the Lord was able to show to me in this text that I would just never noticed before is that you don't have a right to defect when you're a slave. There is an author uh, named Charles Glass. He wrote a book called Deserter, uh, subtitled uh, Hidden Stories of World War II. And in his book, he talks about three different men specifically that are from, some from Tennessee, some from the UK, and they're all on the front lines of World War II. At every point that the struggle gets hard, these guys leave. They're repeatedly found AWOL. They're disappearing. Sometimes they see something horrific and they run. Sometimes they get scared. He also talks about one guy that uh, was actually lured away by basically women and booze. Pretty common occurrence in life. But <clears throat> while really it's a treasonous offense, right? to desert, especially the idea of deserting of a frontline soldier, leaving his post. That's a treasonous offense. And the Galatians here, they're starting to defect. They're getting a message that is giving them the urge and starting to steal some of them away. And the Apostle Paul here is writing to them in an effort to snatch them back. He's really snatching them back. He's yelling at them, much like a parent would yell. And he's telling them, you have no right to defect because you're a slave. Let me read Galatians 1, 6 through 10 real quick, and then we'll get to the text. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a slave of Christ. So the context really, the book of Galatians is written to a church, a, well, a group of churches that Paul interacted with on his very first missionary journey. He's right out of the gate. Him and Barnabas passed through the area of Galatia, which is modern day Turkey. And the gospel spreads through this area pretty rapidly, but it does through some pretty intense experiences by the Apostle Paul. Now, he loves these people. He loves them very much, and he is very much concerned about their spiritual well-being, but he's very personally hurt by what they're doing. And he really lets that be known in, in this book. You can see it very clearly in a couple different ways. Uh, first, just in the very address to this letter, if you look in verse 2 of chapter 1, you see he just says, to the churches of Galatia. Now this is something I'd never really noticed before, but like if you read Ephesians 1, the introduction, when he addresses the, the churches, he says, to the saints who are at Ephesus and the faithful in Christ Jesus. Even 1 Corinthians, the church with, a, with many problems, he said, to the church of God that is in Corinth, those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together, with all those in every place who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus, both his Lord and ours. It's interesting to see here that here he just says to the churches of Galatia. Now, I don't think that that's kind of an overstatement to see that the Apostle Paul is hurt by these people. I think that short little uh, description was on purpose. He's just, hey, just to y'all. Not saints and believers, just, hey, just to y'all. But you also see other ways he's hurt. Just in verse 6, it starts, I am astonished. That's interesting language we'll look at a little bit later. Also, chapter 3 of Galatians starts with, you foolish Galatians. He even says it again a little bit later, you fools, why are you so foolish? His heart is bleeding for these people. But it's not in the sense that he's just mad at them because he's frustrated preachers. He's upset because in Galatians 4, 19 and 20, he says, 
my little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Paul is very frustrated, but like a parent is frustrated at children that are gone astray. He goes on to say, I wish I could be present with you now and I could change my tone, but I'm perplexed about you. He's hurting and he's very confused by his spiritual children. So let's look to the text today, and what we're going to see, the first thing is the apostle is freaked out by how quickly the people are defecting. He says in verse 6, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him. The, the word astonished there is, is an interesting word. It's a strong word in the Greek, the modzo. It really means uh, to be extraordinarily disturbed. Like his, his soul is actually really stirred within him. Even shocked to a painful degree was one suggested translation. And the word also appears in positive ways as well, but in a negative context, that would be an interpretation. He is extremely hurt by these people. Now, why is he hurt? Okay, I found three reasons in the text why he's hurt. First, the people are going AWOL. Verse 6 says, you are so quickly deserting him. That word deserting is a, a very interesting word that took more, a, a bit more reflection than I expected. It's the word metatithemy. It sounds similar to metanoia, which we know is repentance. But metatithemy means, in a sense, a change of direction. But BDAG lexicon actually suggests in this particular usage of it, it means a change in allegiance. It's actually a change in allegiance like a military deserter. Um, it, it can be happened to the father who raises his son to love America. The kid, Fourth of July is his favorite holiday. And he gets up every morning and says the Pledge of Allegiance on his own without anybody telling him just because he likes it. But then his dad turns on the news and sees him fighting for ISIS. That's metatithemy, a change in allegiance. And that's painful for the Apostle Paul. He even says in Galatians 5, 7, you started running well. What's your problem? So the people are going AWOL. Number two, though, they're, they're going AWOL, but they're leaving the perfect gospel. And he puts this phrase in here, he says, you're leaving him who called you by the grace of Christ. It's him who called you by the grace of Christ. This little phrase, you can actually see the gospel, really in its entirety, in this tiny phrase. It says, him, who is the Father. The Father called you by the grace of Christ. The Father called us together by the work of Jesus Christ. Like 1 Corinthians 15, death, burial, resurrection. That's the gospel of Christ. So this is the Father calling you. Paul is screaming at them. The Father called you. How are you going AWOL and leaving this perfect gospel? But he says they're leaving not only the perfect gospel, but they're leaving for a perverted message. He says you're leaving him who called you by the grace of Christ. And you are turning to a different gospel, which is really not another. There is a very heavy amount of significance in the way he worded that. He says you are turning to a different gospel. The word for different there literally means something of in no way the same thing as the other. It is completely different. So it's not in the sense that they are turning to a second gospel, but what they're turning to is in no way a gospel. Because he says at the end of that clause, the relative clause says, which is really not another. That's Paul making the point that it's not another in the sense that it's something of the same kind. But what you guys are turning to is something completely different than the gospel altogether. Even though it looks a lot like it, because what was going on is these Jewish converts to Christ were coming into the land, and they were telling the people, affirming everything about Christ. But then they were saying, also keep the law of Moses. It seems like a small thing. It's just an addition. But what we'll look at in a minute is addition is actually perversion. It's that, just that little twist of the truth. It made me think, really, the, the crucial danger is not from those really way out crazies that speak ridiculous messages. They don't really distract us much. It's when the truth is present, but a little something is added to it, or it's just twisted, modified in just a way that it becomes untruth. Think of the, the garden and the snake, right? That's how all this mess really began, just a little perversion of the truth. Paul goes on to say, there are some disturbing you who want to distort the gospel of Christ. That word could also be translated perverted. It's twisted. It's literally, the word literally means to turn something in the opposite direction. Where it's heading this way and it's looking perfect, but it gets turned in the opposite direction. Completely perverted. So it's not turning to 
another gospel that will save, but it's turning itself away from anything that is the gospel. And I think this is a common practice of the enemy. If he can do this, if he can take the truth, he can turn it an opposite way, even if it's a believer who he has lost. At least he can make them ineffective if he can turn their faith in the opposite way. Now it's shown throughout the text, throughout this entire book of Galatians, that this perversion of the gospel is the addition of the law to it, trying to get the people to turn their allegiance to the law of Moses. And in chapter 3, he says, Oh, you foolish Galatians, who's bewitched you? Verse 2, he says, Let me ask you this. Did you receive the spirit of works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun, begun by the spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Paul's saying, are you serious? I came through, I preached the gospel, you got saved, and now you think there's something that you need to do in addition to that to complete your salvation process or to complete yourself. In response to this, in his commentary on Galatians, John MacArthur says, quote, The law does not moderately pollute grace, but reverses and destroys it. He actually goes on to say, The greatest enemies of the church are not those who openly contradict the Bible and denounce Christ, but those children of hell proposing to speak in his name subtly undermine and distort his true gospel with a system of works righteousness. End quote. Now, I tried to give the Galatians a little bit of a break, try to put myself in their position. See, and, and the best I'd come up with was, well, these guys are thinking, okay, this is the God that revealed himself to the Jews in the beginning. So they got a little, Jews got some cred when they come by. Also, this Jesus himself that we now believe in was a Jew. So maybe we're like, we can, we can give the Jews a little bit, right? It's a real danger to do something with the mindset of exceptions. To really try to live your life or to do something with the express purpose of being accepted by somebody. And I'm sure they were thinking, if we can get and good with these Jews, we'll probably be even better with God then, because that's, that's his people. But it's a, it's a dangerous road. Has anybody other than me ever done anything to be accepted? I'm sure we could all share some pretty stupid stories of something we've done to be accepted by a, a girl or a group or something. But I will say you can't let the temptation for acceptance sabotage the truth. Now, the addition of the law to salvation that is what perverts the truth. Now, Paul is actually extremely harsh in explaining this, and this is one of my favorite passages in Galatians, but it's Galatians 5, uh, verses 2 <coughs> through 4. He says, Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. That's some intense language. He said, Again, I testify to every man who accepts circumcision he is obligated to keep the whole law. Verse 4 says, you are severed from Christ. I don't think that was a word chosen by accident. He's talking about circumcision. So you are severed from Christ. You who would be justified from the law, you have fallen from grace. That's a hard language. A perversion of the truth by addition of the law is lead to you are fallen from grace. Now, it's a very easy hole to fall in, the temptation to add. Now, I heard a lot growing up, and I still hear it a lot now, that, well, I totally believe you, preacher. I believe you message. But I'm, first, I'm going to have to go home, and I'm going to have to quit drinking, and I'm going to have to quit smoking and cursing and running around with folks that do. And then I'll get saved, and I'll come back to your church, and I'll get saved. I've got to clean myself up, get my act together. I'm from Georgia. That's how people talk in North Georgia. It's camp meeting. That's what we do. But I do have an old pastor. He always used to say, you don't clean up before you get in the shower. And it sounded silly when I was a kid, but there's a lot of truth to that old crazy guy's idea. <laughs> but really what happens is you take the work of Christ and everything that he did. That is salvation. It needs nothing, right? We know that. But what we do so often is we'll, t we'll come in and we'll say, well, I got to quit drinking, and I got to quit acting right, and, I, and hey, I got to do good things too. I got to read my Bible, I got to pray right, and I got to check all those boxes that make me Christian. And then once you stand back and look at it, you've accidentally taken Christ's work with your work, 
You've made them equal. That's perversion. That's a perversion of the truth. Now, Paul's judgment of this is very harsh. If you look back in verses 8 and 9 of chapter 1, he says, If even we or an angel should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we've preached to you, let him be accursed. Accursed, anathema, literally devoted to destruction. One translation says, let them be damned to hell if they come and preach to us. goes on in verse 9, he repeats himself really in a way. He says, now I say, if anyone's preaching you a gospel contrary to what you've received, let him be accursed. This is the apostle's judgment, and it's harsh, but it's extremely appropriate. They are perverting the truth of the work of Christ. And he even says it twice, just to be sure you don't miss it. He actually took the time. So that's the apostle attacking them in sorts. He, uh, he's, he's, he's mad at them because they, they're going AWOL. They're leaving the perfect message, and they're leaving and turning to a perverted message. And now he's pronounced his judgment, but finally the apostle is going to give them a proper perspective of their actual situation. And that's verse 10. Now verse 10, I had a little trouble at first in studying this, wondering if it fit with 6 through 9 or whether it fit with 11 in the following. I think it is a hinge point for both, but I think in this sense it does give us a perfect perspective of what the apostle is really saying in 6 through 9. Verse 10 says, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a slave of Christ. So I feel like he's, he's asking them the question, whose approval do you want? Because you're living for these people. So do you want the Savior's approval or the Sadducees' approval? Do you want the Messiah's or the masses? Whose approval are you fishing for? See, these Galatians, they're trying to please the Jews. He really, in a sense, though, and I, I like Paul, and I think this is part of his pastors and his father's heart for the people. He empathizes with their struggle because he says, if I was still trying to please man, I wouldn't be a slave of Christ. And it's interesting that he does that. He identifies with what they're going through because he was that same guy. And it really, in a sense, the same group, although they weren't believers of Christ. But he sought to be the Pharisee of Pharisees, right? He worked with this group to find approval and really identify himself with these people. And I think this admission that he was given in the past moves them into the proper perspective by acknowledging his own slavery to Christ and also, in a way, implying theirs. The proper perspective is that believers are slaves of Christ. We are. The moment you're born, you're a slave. Either slave to sin, when you get saved, you're a slave to Christ. You will live your entire life in slavery of some sort. Now, I know I'm a white guy up here talking about slavery, so that's weird. Slavery is a hard word, and for good reason. It has a terrible past. Slavery is it's really never had a good experience. And even back Israel in Egypt, how well their slavery didn't go so well, right? Because Pharaoh was evil. In America, we, there's plenty we could say about that. But slavery was horrific because of evil people. And before Christ, the slavery that we were actually in as well was deadly because our master was sin. This is Romans 6, 20 and 21. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regards to righteousness. Hey, you were free of righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. Slaves to sin leads only to death. Now, the key, though, however, to slavery is who the master is. It's who the master is. That's the key to slavery. For the Galatians then and for us now, as believers, slavery is our salvation because our master is God. Listen to the very next verse, Romans 6, 22. But now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. The proper perspective is that all believers are slaves to God. And we have no rights of our own. It's a tough thing to remember. It's a tough thing to put in practice. That we don't have rights of our own, that we are actually slaves of God. He's our master, but that slavery will lead to eternal life. So, in Glass's book, these three guys, they all abandon their posts several times. They come and they go. They get scared. They run. They get lured away. They run. But it's much like we do 
but our call to be slaves and servant of, servants of God as well. However, these guys, when they were given the, return, the chance to return, every one of them was given the chance to actually come back and rejoin their unit and prove themselves as soldiers. But every time, they ran. They ran. Most of them ended up court-martialed or, or worse. But in our lives as believers, I say we'll, we will stumble and we will run probably more than once from what we really need to be and what we're called and instructed to be. But I think if we can keep the truth of our slavery to Christ in our mind, we'll realize we have no right to defect, but also we'll have no need to leave the God of our salvation. Thank you.